Hi everybody, uh, my name is Ray. Um, I am now a senior solutions advisor at a company called 8Base. Um, little backstory, so originally uh, 8Base was a low code platform uh, that was designed to help developers. And then back in November, we started playing around with AI uh, and we invented, we created Archie. Um, and part of that process was back in November, I stopped being a developer advocate uh, and I became an engineer once again, but uh, focused specifically on AI. So this talk that I'm giving is about a bunch of stuff that I built. Um, I don't propose, like I don't claim to be an AI expert. This is just a lot of learning in the last six months. Um, but part of what I'm going to talk about is uh, some of the local stuff we had to build to experiment to get to our production AI uh, these days. So uh, this is Archie, and what Archie essentially is, it's an AI product architect. So the idea that we uh, came with Archie is that you start with something as simple as just a description of what you want your software application to be. So just something like that. It can be one line, it could be, you could copy paste an entire document in there. Um, and then what Archie does is it takes that um, and it builds out everything in your requirements analysis design phases. So you get a problem statement, uh, solution statement, challenges, significance. Um, going into user types, you get things like your needs and pain points for each user. It develops use cases for each one of the user uh, types. Uh, advanced considerations, so it gives you things like security requirements, compliance requirements. For compliance, it'll actually go into the compliance frameworks and give you chapter and verse of things you'll need to think about. Uh, for modules and application services, uh, it basically it's all your features. Uh, so you'll get uh, names, descriptions, and then you'll get requirements for each of the uh, modules, and you'll get user stories for each of the requirements. Um, and then getting into design, uh, it talks about your form factors, it draws out a site map for what your application would be, um, and it even starts developing things like some mid-fidelity wireframes um, you know, that are responsive. Um, but it's, it's a pretty cool piece of tech to be able to go from just an idea to uh, moving on to development much faster than you typically would uh, in a requirements process. Now, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is that one of the features we wanted to build uh, with Archie, and we wanted him, it, I'm not going to say him, because I'm not exactly sure w how, why we would genderize it. Uh, but so Archie, uh, one of the reasons, one of the cool things we wanted to develop with it was the ability for it to talk to you, and you can talk to it about your project. So it needed to have the entire context of the project that you're working on, which was everything that you're seeing here. So we uh, developed this chat component, and we also have this architecture and planning component, which is a piece of the chat component, but focuses more on things like tech stack, scope of work, the ability to generate all this kind of stuff. Now, uh, in order to uh, implement this for Archie, we needed to, uh, we needed to implement what's called RAG. Um, and if anybody doesn't know what RAG means, it, it stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. So the ability for the AI to pull data from uh, a location in order to be able to provide context to give answers. Uh, there were two methods in which we did that. Uh, the first, is that big enough? Uh, the first is what's called tools. And so what tools are, are uh, basically uh, functions that you uh, pass uh, a definition to the AI in terms of the name of the function and a description of what it does. Um, and then that gives the ability for the AI to call that function uh, should it determine that it needs that specific information. So I could show an example here. This is a local version that we call the Archie emulator. And this is essentially all of the AI stuff that the production website does, but localized to a CLI so that we can develop and debug. So if I go here into this project and I say to chat, um, I can ask it a question, like for example, uh, how many modules are in my project? And it's able to go off and 
I'm connected to the internet, right? Yes, okay. Right, so it says my project contains a total of 10 modules, lists out the modules. Pretty cool. So if I turn on these debug points, we could probably get a bit more of an understanding here. I'll ask that question again. How many modules are in my project? And so what the AI does is it actually uh, takes in the question and I've fed it a list of what all the tools are that it can access. So from the question, it inferred that it needed to understand modules inside my project. So it ended up calling this get requirements modules tool right here. And so what this function does is it takes, it goes through the information of the project, it pulls out all the modules and it returns them. So the AI is able to access my local code to retrieve the modules and then use the information returned from that in order to very slowly provide the answer. So this was the first step uh, in terms of the RAG, uh, but the second step was to be able to let it be not so specific in, or be able to let the user to be not so specific in terms of the questions that they asked. So we didn't want it to be able, we didn't want the user to have to be limited to saying, let's talk about modules, let's talk about applications. Um, this project here that's looking to be built uh, is related to animals. So if I wanted to ask a question, um, you know, uh, what parts of my project discuss veterinarians? Right? Uh, it actually needs to, it can't just go looking at modules, it can't just go looking at applications. And we don't really want it to have to call every one of the tools trying to grab all the information and trying to get an answer. Um, that would be very long and it would use a lot of the context window. And uh, even though, you know, a, uh, OpenAI and other models have like 120,000 token context windows, uh, you could still run out of that when you see all of this type of information that needs to come back. Uh, so, how do we solve that problem? Uh, we solve that problem uh, using uh, Chroma. Well, initially Chroma. Our production uh, version uses Pinecone. Uh, but Chroma is actually what I was using to uh, develop this capability to uh, create embeddings, store what's called vectors, and, uh, and be able to get uh, answers uh, that way. Um, I did a little, this is my easiest way <laughs> to explain what vectors are uh, to somebody who doesn't understand vectors. Um, essentially what, when you vectorize data, what you're doing is you're, this is, and I, trust me, I know there are much smarter people in here who are gonna listen to my explanation and have a lot of uh, small corrections on what that might be. But the basic understanding is that uh, in order to vectorize the data, it will take the data, it will, in this example, it will create um, almost coordinates for what that data is, and it will place it inside your vector store. So in this example here, we have the word farmer. And so uh, the vectorization created the embedding and placed it over here. And then it also, we vectorized the word keyboard. And so it created a, a, a location and it placed it over here. Then when we search for something like potato, for example, what will happen is, a, and oh, didn't want to do that. An embedding will be created for that word and it will search against, that drag sucks, there we go. It will search against uh, the vectors and return the closest ones. So the location that it creates for potato ends up about here and farmer is closer. So farmer will have a, uh, a closer score to potato than keyboard will. Does that kind of make sense? That's like my best way of explaining it. Uh, considering that, you know, I only know a limited amount. Um, so, how do we do this here? Well, what I have actually done is I created uh, a whole synchronized embedding inside of our, uh, our RAG package. And what I do is I go through all of the data and for each one of the classes, um, I pull out the embedding. So I pull out the relevant information, things like the problem statement or each challenge for the problem statement. And every one of those strings, we vectorize and we store inside of, uh, inside of Chroma or inside of uh, Pinecone, inside of our vector database. And then what we end up doing in that example, I'll turn these breakpoints back on, 
is if I ask that same question, uh, what, uh, what parts of the project discuss veterinarians? What happens is we actually have uh, passed a tool to the AI that's a search tool. And we basically in the description say, um, this allows you to search ac across the array of data in order to find answers. So you can see here we have this search function. And what the search function does is it does a similarity search based on specific words. So here it says uh, the AI determined that we should try to find veterinarians inside of the data. So we're doing a search on veterinarians and then when the results come back, we have this list of results. Let's see if I can find a better way to show that. Nope. So this list of results here is actually a list of documents where the vector uh, is related to veterinarian. So here we see veterinarian, and then I have a bunch of additional metadata plugged in, saying, so veterinarian here, uh, the metadata shows that this is uh, a user type inside of the blueprint. Um, and the project is the project we're working on. Uh, there's an identifier for that. So what it'll do is that it'll then take the results of the search and uh, depending on what information it gleans from the vectorizing, it'll actually end up calling other tools in order to pull more information. So if for, in this example here, it found a user type called veterinarian, so now it wants to pull all of the information for that user type in order to get more context to provide the right answer. So I'm actually gonna turn those breakpoints back off because it could end up doing like nine or 10 calls depending on what we want. But once it does all that, we get the answer. So we have a user type of veterinarian and we saw that whole big spiel that happens. Um, now, when it comes to using Chroma, it's pretty awesome because, you know, people get very uh, daunted by some of the technology that's involved and some of the SaaS products they have to work with in order to use some things. Uh, but Chroma actually gives you the capability to have a vector store locally. So if I look here inside of all of my data, I actually have uh, in my DB here, I actually have this Chroma stored locally in a file, it's a SQLite file, and then all of my embeddings, you can see here. Uh, and there's a, there's a better table for that. Let's check metadata, see how cool that one is. Right, so that's all the metadata related to each of the embeddings. Um, what I wanted to do, and what I will do by the end of the week, uh, is I'll have actual source code examples. I can't, this is all of our proprietary stuff, so I can't put these uh, out on the web, but I'll have source code examples uh, that I can then post inside of, the, um, inside of the Discord, so you can actually download and just run uh, a good example of uh, putting vectors in and working with vectors locally. Uh, so that's what I have. Um, please feel free to ask any and all questions. Yes? In terms of hardware requirement to run these models, uh, what's the reasonable spec implications? Right, so in terms of uh, hardware requirements for running all of these locally, the models themselves, I'm not running locally. I'm actually going out to, uh, to, to the various uh, servers um, that support them. And Archie uses a bunch of different models depending on what it wants to accomplish. So. Yeah, only the vector database is stored uh, locally. Everything else goes out. We use uh, Anthropic for some of the more visual things, like the wireframes. Uh, we use OpenAI for a lot of it, but um, we're also working through more models as we fine tune Archie to uh, be better at what we're trying to get it to do. <laughs> no problem. Anybody else? Yes? Um, so you um, the vector database uh, locally. Uh, I, I wanted to ask why you put it locally, because if you put it into the server, mm -hmm. you can do the similar refresh um, there, which is faster. Yeah, so in our production, 
Uh, sorry, just to summarize, uh, in case anyone didn't hear, he, he asked why I'm using it locally. So in our production, we're using Pinecone, and we're use that, that's up in a server. One of the benefits that we really like about Pinecone is that um, we have all of the projects siloed by namespaces. Um, which really gives a lot of comfort to our clients to the fact that you know when we're doing our vector searches It's only on that specific data in that namespace uh, Chroma was really so this whole thing from the start in November um, Hasn't just been uh, a development experience, but it's been a learning experience for me And so I've been doing a lot of experimenting figuring out how this stuff works and Putting Chroma locally allowed me to do it like right right on my machine and better understand um, and also when we, when we debug things, uh, having that local access um, is very useful. And also from like a data perspective, we're not out there trying to grab uh, you know, uh, data that's out on the internet when we can do debugging locally first to see whether or not we could solve the problem. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question. Mm -hmm. There was a UI innovation. Uh, how did you um, like, This one? Yeah. How do you, uh, so can AI generate the UI on HTML or is there like a um, predefined like, menu and heading and then spilling off those Right, so at the moment there's, there's certain parts that are predefined and there's certain parts that the AI does. Um, when I first started working the, with this, uh, the imaging uh, that AI did kind of sucked and it was all very conceptual and weird. Um, I couldn't get, I literally was telling it to give me a button as it would look like on a web page rendered from HTML and it would, it would do insane things. <laughs> so what we ended up doing was getting it to generate HTML code. So all of this is HTML code. Uh, there's a couple of things in terms of um, you know, use this use this CSS framework in order to generate in order to generate that kind of stuff. Um, but so it's a mixture of predefined stuff and uh, what the AI determines from uh, all of the context beforehand. So it takes all of the modules, all the uh, the application services, and the use cases. It determines what screens would be needed for that application, um, and then it creates mid fidelity wireframes. No problem. Way in the back. Oh, or right there first. Yeah, go. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Bobby. Um, Hi. I'm very much into levels of confidence. So when you have your graph there sitting this right, the potato is closer to the farmer than it is to the people. Yeah. Right? Uh, does the, um, the RAG framework give you the, uh, what I call a level of confidence, help uh, confident it's, it's uh, uh, a farmer than a potato? Yeah. So. Sorry, keep going. I was going to say, like, if there's a, a couch in there, right, it would say, yeah, it's closer to a farmer, but it might be a couch. But... Right, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, let's ask, uh, where in the project, in the project, do we discuss couches? Uh, oh, did I? No. Enable. Oh, I caught it. Good. Awesome. All right. <laughs> so, uh, you can see in the results that are returned, um, yeah, let's do it here. Uh, there is a score right here. So the number, uh, that number right there, is like a confidence score. Um, and the higher it is, and usually when you, one of the things you could specify is to return in the order of confidence. So that's what this is doing here. It's, it's determining uh, what's the most confident. It returns that. Um, I don't know if this emulator code takes into account things that don't make sense. There you go any relevant uh, resulting in couches. So it was able to figure that out based on uh, the scores. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah, OK. Where's, where's the mic? OK. <laughs> What's up? I was interested in the fact that you were able to query the, your code and ask people questions about the, the folder in which your uh, code is present. Do you have specific functions that you can, you can do? Like we have like a list of things that you can do and uh, rest it. It's, so for us, the function, the, the, the tools that we've created are all about retrieving uh, context of the project itself. But when it comes to AI, you can essentially create any tool that you want. You just create a function that executes something, and as long as you describe it well enough to the AI what that tool will accomplish, uh, it'll execute that code. How does it go from uh, like 
I understand where you could say that you have these many tools and the AI has to decide which one this particular product should go to. How do you do the uh, networking from there to the tool? How does that work? Like, what does the LLM give you in response? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Essentially, what we've done is we just feed the tools in and we ask the question and, sorry, so we use Langchain along with, uh, uh, along with uh, all of this stuff. And Langchain, is, it figures all that out for us. We actually didn't have to do a lot of work on that. We just said, ask the question, here's the tools available, and it does all of the back and forth. Is it those outdoors and the Langgraphs thing? Sorry? This, this, in Langgraph, I think there are a few people that play Routers where it helps you redirect your workflow with the tools. What, how do you do it using Langchain? Oh, uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, it would probably be under rag. Oh, no, uh, it's under chat. So the chain that I have in chat, it takes a prompt that we have that we've, uh, we've kind of fine-tuned over time. Uh, it adds in specific information. And then the, the chain itself is, no, I think we just use a prompt for the most part. Yeah, so we have, we have a prompt that comes from a, a message that we created and we just feed it the prompt, we feed it the tools. Um, we didn't even need to really create a chain uh, for this part. But we have what's called an agent as executor. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so the agent executor is what handles the, the back and forth part. Yeah, yeah. thank you. No problem. We have one up here. We actually have three up here. Oh, that's perfect. How are the scores calculated? Oh, that's, that, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a vector distance. Sorry? It's just a vector distance. So the vectors that you're showing, just the length of the right. vector between them is the yeah, so that, Yeah, that makes sense. So it's like the, the, when I was showing this, right? Right? It's, so it's the distance between the two. So it calculates, it takes the word, it breaks it down the same way the location did when it was creating these embeddings, and then it calculates the distance between the two. Uh, there, there's multiple, like you could choose. There, there's a bunch of different ones. Uh, we use the default because I'm not smart enough to figure out the rest of them. So. <laughs> No problem. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm curious. Uh, do you see this being used more at the beginning stages of a project, or are you looking for it to be used over the course of the entire development? Archie itself. Yeah. Um, so we've uh, at this point we've determined two different main uh, user types. The first is an ideator, someone who you know they have an idea for a project. Um, and this is a great kind of starting point to flesh everything out. Uh, the second is agencies, because agencies uh, have leads coming in constantly, um, and right now it takes, it takes real time and effort to, uh, to prep even for that first initial meeting uh, with their leads to, to even try to win a project. Whereas here with Archie, they can plug the idea in. They could have, so this whole process, um, you can have, go from your idea to having all of this fleshed out in, um, in less than a day. And so you could prep for a lead, uh, like a first meeting with a lead in less than a day and have so much more ready for that first meeting. If I can ask one follow-up. Yeah. Um, if you, let's say I was a client mm -hmm. in a niche market and I had my own way of uh, defining a, an idea to give to a client, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So uh, there's a couple of things uh, we're we're working on uh, implementing a lot of organizational features. One of the ones we have right now is you can predefine like a preferred tech stack, and you can predefine uh, an outline for a scope of work. Right. So this like front end technologies, and then this scope of work here, right here. You can predefine the format for that. Some of the other things we're working on right now. 
um, is uh, the ability to white label things so that when you export it, it's exported uh, with your own company name on it. Um, but the other piece about this is for the architecture and planning, we didn't want it to be as rigid as a requirements design. We wanted the ability for Archie to generate you a scope of work and then you say, well, no, like I want this focus or can you include cost estimates based off this? So it's the, the point of uh, the architecture and planning being conversational was, was on purpose in order to accomplish that. And also to give it the ability to say exactly here, I'll put it in Polish so that <laughs> if you have clients, they can, out, they can uh, translate, which is pretty cool. We'll do one more question. One more question? Thank you. Uh, I have two questions for this one. One is, uh, so when you run RG, so you can prompt, hey, here's a business idea that I want to get you to analyze and come up with all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, in total, how many requests do you end up sending to all of them? Right, so that is a bit of a loaded question in the sense that we designed Archie to not be a one-shot AI. So everything that gets loaded here is one step, but then let's say I'm in here and I have user types and I wanna add a parent user type. You can actually just tell Archie, add a parent user type. It'll go and do all of the research, all the use cases, all that same stuff, right? Um, so for this example here, uh, this did 233 AI requests and 642,000 tokens to get where it's at right now. Well, yeah, of course. It's, it's AI. It comes up with different stuff all the time. Um, you know, and some of the things we're working on is, uh, is when it goes nuts, right? Because AI tends to go nuts sometimes. So we'll get use cases that don't make sense. We'll get user types that don't make sense. We're running a lot of POCs with agencies right now uh, to get their feedback and to fine tune, um, fine -tune our prompts. We, we haven't got into fine tuning models yet. Uh, part of the reason being because you know people's ideas are very, uh, very important to them, and they don't want their data being used to to teach other things. So that's a piece that we're treading on lightly right now. No problem. All right. All good.